All right, welcome back, everyone. We are here with a, a I guess it's emergency episode, emergency pod, emergency <laughs> pod, <laughs> emergency pod. I've always you are. Yeah, usually, usually they're for. Uh, I think they're usually for like political happenings, but this is you know this is the biggest thing that's happened in our world in a long time. So breaking news, breaking yeah, news on Twitter. So we're here with <laughs> Sam Selikoff, um, you know buddy of mine for a while now uh and so we figured since we were partially a react show at this point since we seem to talk about react every week and <laughs> sam's a react uh guru and he became the main character on twitter this week that we the most on memed and... man on the internet this week yeah. this is the man that put a sequel injection attack inside of a button and he is here to tell us why it's a great idea apparently uh, this is this was my favorite this was my favorite week on the internet because like Let you and i have been internet friends for a while you and ian are like in-person friends but i'm like i know that guy that guy in every single meme i'm like yeah it's actually pretty funny so emergency pod to get you here to to talk about it but we're gonna talk about a lot of stuff Nice. Yeah, I was saying that too. I was open. I was still at the conference in San Francisco, and every time I open up Twitter, it was just like my fate. I was like, I know that guy. I was like, all right, I'm getting tired of this. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was. It was actually a blast. It was a lot of fun, and um, yeah, we'll we'll definitely talk all about it. So, so maybe you could lay the groundwork a little bit, because I mean, so just baseline what you do and your connection to React, and then where you were. You know, when this happened, at first I didn't realize it was like real time. And I was like, oh, like he's at a conference doing this. And then like it's all blown up and everything. So give us your quick little background because some of our audience definitely isn't in the React world and might not know you. And then we can dive into the, I'm sure they've seen your face at this point, but they, they might not know who you are and what you do. So definitely. And uh, we want to cross post this to our podcast too. So yep. just to kind of lay the groundwork, because I think the conversation will be good for both you know, folks who are back-end Laravel developers and then folks who follow us who identify more as front-end developers. Um, I think there's like a lot of good stuff that we can talk about. So, you know, I started programming about 10 years ago. I actually learned MVC through Symfony. So Perl was my first language, but Ooh. PHP was my first like web framework um, yep. experience. And um, basically kind of fell in love with front-end early on just from some work projects that were... Um, pretty like dynamic, I guess, like heavy, rich clients. It was like a survey that I built at this financial software company and it was using D3 to do data visualization. And I was using Backbone at the time and Backbone didn't have like a router. So I wanted to be able to send the survey around to everyone in the company, have them like click on clients or quarters and have the data visualization like charts update and then push, you know, searches and filters to the URL so they could share some sub part of the survey. And so um, that's kind of when I fell in love with JavaScript and realized that's like the part of web development that I love the most. And, um, you know, the data viz stuff was fun. I think you have a, a accounting background, Aaron. I was studying like finance and economics. And so um, when I first started learning programming, that was like really fun for me to be able to do some of that stuff in the browser and then make it do exactly what I want with SVG and interactions and all that good stuff. Um, so I started doing Backbone and Laravel as the back end, or not Laravel, PHP Symphony at the time. I kind of wish I would have found Laravel back then. My history could have been very different. I don't even know it existed, yeah, yeah. but this was like in 20, this would have been in like 2012, 2013. Um, yeah, it was, I guess it was, Laravel was maybe just out, yeah. So Laravel's 10-ish. So. Yeah, but Symphony was pretty hip back then, right? My brother used it. That's why I learned it. So. Right. <laughs> um, it, was cool. it was cool enough. It's yeah. Yeah, it no Laravel, but it was cool enough. Exactly. Um, so anyways, I started doing more and more on the front end and then kind of found Ember. And Ember was like kind of the logical conclusion of like where my interests were pointing me towards because... It had a built-in router. It had, you know, it basically fully embraced like the SPA model where mm. your first, the first thing you want to do is start making rich client side stuff. And again, because of the kinds of things I was building, I was like, 
this is the most important part of this app. And so this is what I want a tool that's kind of good for, I guess, or like built for. It's built to build interactive UIs on the web. And basically most of my jobs before I started working for myself were like internal back office apps or, you know, and then eventually I worked at TED with Ryan and we were building tools to help the team run the conference. And there was all sorts of stuff like that where, you know, we used Ember there as well. And I remember us adding an Ember front end to like a Rails back end. And um, the only thing that we did was basically put the Ember app instead of the view, the templates from Rails, the ERB templates. And it was this long list of attendees that was like a master detail UI. And at the conference, uh, this woman we worked with was like trying to find people and she would be able to use it on an iPad, click somebody and then see the detail. And then she realized like the side scrolling, the, the navigation list of all the people didn't reset because, you know, Ember was doing just partial re-rendering of the detail view, but the, the, uh, the list of attendees and the parents stayed the same. So it preserved mm -hmm. like the scroll position. And that like blew her mind. That was like the most useful thing to her in that moment uh, at the conference. And so this is always kind of like um, the things that really got me going, working, and, th and that's why I kind of went down the, the rich JavaScript path or whatever. Um, and so Ember was kind of how I cut my teeth on like UI development and learning how to do state in the browser and all the things that go along with that. And, um, eventually started using react, you know, and, uh, that's kind of where I am today. So, yeah. Um, so, and you do, uh, like build UI, which is a course, um, I guess, what, I guess it's like a video you just screencasting site. Screen yeah, it's like a screencasting site. site. Yeah. We make, you, we make you courses. You just launched something, right? We just launched a remix course. Yep. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll need to talk about that too because I've been – I just found out that your podcast exists, so I've been binging the back – I've been binging back episodes, and so I feel like oh, I wow. have caught up on the past oh, you know, wow. four nice. or five months. <laughs> awesome. Two. Yeah, awesome. it's been fun. So I guess for your audience too, maybe we'll just quick intro ourselves so that everybody's yes, absolutely. on the same page. But um, yeah, I'm Ian Landsman, and I've been selling a help desk product for 20 years, all PHP. Um, you know, it's Laravel. Uh, Taylor of Laravel worked here for a while. Um, I run the Laravel job board, and I've been involved. Yeah, you in knew Taylor like when he started things. Laravel, right? Yeah, just a little bit after. Yeah, he worked with Ian Speed is the Godfather. Years. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's how I think of him. Community, <laughs> the Godfather. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of uh, I'm in the Laravel circles is my main thing. Do not like JavaScript. Do not like the front end JavaScript. Like to avoid it mm -hmm. as much as possible. Although uh, I do also understand the benefits of it and like to have things work magically. I just don't like to necessarily be in there. Uh, I like yep. to drop a component in and have it work magically. I don't necessarily mm. want to write the component. So mm -hmm. hate the um, JavaScript, love the component. I there you go. That. <laughs> hey, yeah, that's music to my ears, that's, man. That's kind of how I coach. feel. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Aaron. This is my voice. Um, I always feel like when you're when you got three people on a podcast and they all kind of sound the same, you never know who is who. So. <laughs> I'm I'm Aaron. Uh, I'm a developer educator at a database company called Planet Scale. Um, so I make a lot of uh, YouTube videos uh, these days. Uh, so we got a lot of video stuff we could talk about too. But absolutely, yeah, Laravel developer. Um, also primarily back end, not a big front end uh, guy. And yeah, that's probably enough. Um, cool. Love, love making the videos, love teaching. So we You're have that. You're doing great with those. You know? Yeah, thanks. I really I appreciate that. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. I, I, I was going to say one I've been thinking about, well, I've been thinking about this sort of thing for a while, but one way we could kind of kick off the conversation or at least one way I think about, I can talk about the conference talk soon, but I was thinking to set some context, like, so I ended up kind of being like a front end developer or whatever. And the front end ecosystem, JavaScript ecosystem, you know, as folks who are more back end developers have pointed out is really fragmented. It feels like there's a lot of wheel reinventing going on and it's confusing why people would use some tools or setups, um, when, you know, more established tool sets exist like Ruby on Rails, like Laravel that give you so much more out of the box. And um, I think 
one, one way I've started to think about this is like kind of going back to my story of how I even became like more in the front end community is basically that story. And, and one way I've thought about putting it is high floor versus high ceiling. So if you think this is kind of, I'm just working, workshopping this, but just let, let me spitball for a little bit. Yeah. If you think about starting with an established framework, like a Laravel, you're starting off at an extremely high floor, okay. right? And if you go back to the development of something like Laravel or Ruby on Rails, there's a floor there that keeps getting raised up with every release, every feature, every new package. So that, you know, DHH talks about this a lot in his keynotes where he says, Ruby on Rails is about conceptual compression, mm -hmm. doing more with less. So we want to have a high floor, and that's kind of like where we're starting the whole process of like working on these frameworks. And uh, on the other hand, if you put yourself in my shoes back when I was working on that survey, I had an idea for this UI I wanted to build. And I had an idea for the end state, the ceiling, and I didn't want to be limited by anything, so I knew I had to just drop down to JavaScript because I wanted to be able to use all the browser APIs as opposed to an abstraction that you know maybe a backend tool gave me or some other library gave me. I mean, I even ended up ditching like charting libraries to use D3 because mm -hmm. D3 is in that same level of abstraction where you just get raw access to SVG elements and all the JavaScript that you would ever need because you have access to the full set of browser APIs. And so that's kind of one way I've been thinking about this. And if you think about the JavaScript folks who have an idea for a UI they want to build, like Trello, let's say, when it first comes out. We're building Trello. We have an idea for the UI, the user experience, how we want that part to be like the differentiator, the novel part of this product. Then, or a Figma or whatever it is, right? But I think Trello is a good example because that's something that we could build today. Then you want a tool that's going to help you do that and feel like you can build that without restriction. Whereas... You know, again, as folks like y'all have pointed out, I think rightfully so, if you're starting a new company and you need to get something quick, you want a higher floor to start out with. And then if you look at how both ecosystems have developed over time, the Laravels and the Rails, which start off on a high floor, have basically been trying to raise the ceiling with things like TurboLinks or, what is it, Livewire? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Or all of these abstractions that have come to Rails and Laravel to make it so that we can get more of the rich interaction on top of this high floor. And so they've been trying to raise the ceiling, but it's not going to be the same unless you drop down to JavaScript and then you lose some of that cohesion and in the integration. Whereas the JavaScript folks said, let's start with the high ceiling, which has a really low floor because we gave up all the stuff that these integrated server side conventional frameworks give us and let's try to raise the floor so we're starting with a high ceiling and let's try to raise the floor so that's kind of how i see the two ecosystems having started and growing over time and they serve different needs um but um ultimately i think we're all trying to have tools that give us a high floor and a high ceiling it's just that the front end system has focused more on the ceiling and the back end system has focused more on the floor historically that's kind of like I'm just workshopping that, but that's kind of how I've been thinking about things. What lately. do you got, Ian? What do you? What, I know, <laughs> I know you're ready. Yeah, uh, that part <laughs> seems fine. Like I think that's. I, I think it, to me, it's kind of. I I've been taking it more even simpler than that. I think in the sense of just like in terms of what's going on and like, you know, the JavaScript putting SQL in the JavaScript on the front end and all that <laughs> stuff. Like. We'll get to we're that. Gonna we'll keep, get to we're going to keep saying things. that and not let you defend okay. it, but we're going to keep saying the, it. But like, we'll, no, we'll, I'll defend it. Don't no, worry. No, no, I, I, I'll have the I last actually, lap. I, yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm not even concerned with that in the sense of like, obviously everybody was going crazy on it, but I'm sure I was very <laughs> confident that it wasn't like a SQL injection vector. Uh, yeah, I would have been yeah. very surprised if they were putting something like that out there. But, but I just think like there's all these JavaScript developers and they just want to stay in JavaScript. Just like I'm a Laravel developer and I just want to stay in Laravel. So like I like Livewire because I can stay like 90% of the time in Laravel and only go to JavaScript when I have right. to. And then if you're a JavaScript developer, you want to stay in JavaScript and only go to thinking about the database or you know whatever back end systems when you have to. And so if we can shove that stuff in the JavaScript as much as possible, then I don't have to think about what the server is doing and server side code, I can just stay in my JavaScript land and know that I can query something from here or whatever and get the data back and 
do all the weird JavaScript arrays slicing and whatever you do in JavaScript um, <laughs> and all that stuff uh, without having to leave the zone I'm comfortable with. And since now we've made right. so many JavaScript developers because like the world's gone a little bit haywire with like everything is SPA and like mm -hmm. everything is ultra reactive all the time, right? That you have all these people who have become JavaScript developers and it's like, yeah, well, we just want to do the other parts of the coding stack from here. We don't want to go over and learn Laravel or Rails or all those things. So that's, I guess, my That is a simpler explanation. And it's also totally valid. I mean, DHH always talks about how much he loves Ruby. And so that's right. that's totally right. <laughs> He's like, I want to stay in Ruby, right? Stay in like, Ruby, yeah. <laughs> you know? But, but it is, I do think it's interesting because, because everyone in the React community was in other community. Well, everyone who created all these front-end tools we're using backend tools or backend server-side languages first. Right. So for me, I, I enjoyed Symfony and then I started using Rails at my job and I really liked Ruby. I mean, Ruby is awesome. It's awesome. And Rails is awesome. And um, I didn't have a problem with Ruby. And the only reason I used JavaScript is because I wanted to animate SVGs when you hovered them or clicked on them. So the that was something you can't do with Ruby. Yeah. Unless you write CoffeeScript, or, <laughs> you know, which was a, a terrible that. idea, <laughs> ultimately, in, in retrospect. But um, I wanted, I, that was my motivation. I wanted to animate a pie chart when you hovered it with a mouse. That's what I was trying to do. So, um, yeah. Humble beginnings. Yeah, I like, I like, the, I like the floor ceiling analogy. Uh, I would, I would expect extend it to say that the javascript floor is like underground y'all it's like oh, yeah. it's, it's <laughs> below with, the basement it's way yeah. down there <laughs> it uh, doesn't pass the inspection code no, anymore for a house <laughs> y'all gotta just stop digging at some point but yeah so i like that i do think um when you start to talk about like turbo and livewire which is which are very similar to you know live view over in the phoenix elixir world same kind of like mm -hmm. even htmx is is very similar to these mm -hmm. ideas where it's you know primarily server rendered sent over and then morphed out to be you know the front end i can understand i think the argument there that the ceiling is a little bit uh lower because of the things that you you can do not with those technologies but just with the paradigm itself of like we're right. going to send some new html over the wire and morph it in like yeah you can't really mm -hmm. do a hover animation in that case not very not very right. performantly but i do i also think that there's like there's another paradigm that is ceiling less and that's like the inertia js um style where it's you know, you pair your fully featured server backend with a little bit of protocol glue in the middle, and then you put your whatever, you know, React, Vue, Svelte, you put your that front end um, on the front end. And then you have your back into like the, the limitless ceiling world of I can just use React for anything I want, but I still get the power of, you know, queues and database drivers and emails and cron jobs and all of that from my Laravel or Rails application. So I feel like that's a little bit like if you're trying to do HTML over the wire, I get it. Yeah, you're going to get stuck at mm -hmm. some point, maybe. But otherwise, mm -hmm. you could go full React land. Yes. And um, yeah, so inertia is nice because it it um, takes care of the protocol, basically. And it makes that as like invisible as possible. And that's basically what we were doing with SPAs, if you think about it. Our first video screencasting site, which was embermap.com, mm. was an Ember SPA um, with a Rails API backend. And so we used Rails for sending emails and for doing jobs and for authentication and database, you know, active record, all that stuff. And so the protocols, you spent more time back then because something like inertia didn't exist mm -hmm. or this the APIs or even GraphQL was a, 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 another way to kind of solve that problem um, to kind of try to minimize the, the loss there in productivity. Um, but uh, I guess this kind of leads to my talk at NextConf last week, which is really about, it was, it's more about, it's about React. It was at NextConf because Next is like the first implementation of kind of the newer set of APIs coming to React. But um, hold on, hold on. Can we can we uh, stop for one yeah, second? Yeah. 
I've, I've avoided this for a very long time. Very, very long time. But I yeah, guess yeah, yeah. in this conversation, I'm going to have to actually know what the hell next is. Like, can you give me the, like, one-minute explanation <laughs> of what the hell next is? Because, 30 like, seconds. I've, Make it I've, 30 seconds. I've literally avoided this minute. intentionally the, for a year or five years or whatever it's been going on. God, Ian, but there's no the better there's no better co-host for me than you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, give us next 30 is seconds. Like 30 what is seconds. it? It's like Laravel 1.0 or whatever, okay. you know, for, Ra- for React. Server side, though, executed. Well, that was the big thing. So React has the ability to do server side rendering, okay. but setting it up to do so in a tool chain was tricky. Uh, was complicated. And okay. so next was the first to package it together. Okay. So next but- is a framework on top of React. Mm hmm. Is it. Client side also. It's like uh, it's like no. doesn't doesn't view you all use view right? Doesn't view have Nuxt? It's kind of like that. I don't know anything about for me, React, but I've never I've never <laughs> used Nuxt. I'm not sure <laughs> okay, I understand yeah. anymore now. So so it just it just adds it like it, React by itself just renders right, um, and it knows so how it to like provides the ROM, routing right? and stuff like that too. Exactly, right? okay. routing conventions around file system names and okay. um, bundler setup so you can import you know, modules from other modules because JavaScript is just turtles all the way down. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny because you start using JavaScript and you're like coming from Ruby and you're like, well, yeah, Ruby has like, you can import packages. Like it has a concept of packages, like every other freaking programming language. Right. Yep. And like JavaScript didn't have that for a long time. They act, actually, who cats who cr- let, created Ember, like spearheaded all of that. But it's because JavaScript, the language, has many, many run times. It mm. originally only ran in the browser. Then it started running on the server with Node. Right. And even if you're not writing it an HTTP server with JavaScript, you still want to do things on the server, like pre-render your React app into HTML so that it can be served up on a CDN or something like that, which is like kind of what Next did at the beginning. Mm. So anyways, getting... Uh, All right, Ian, so you tell me, what is next? (laughs) Now that that, that you know, explain it back to me. I get the concept it's a a framework over React. Uh, I'm still not totally sure if it also runs on the front end or if it's only for back end, but uh, I I get the general idea of the it's providing all the glue stuff so that you can have routes and connections and standardization of the packages and stuff like that okay so it's just a back end mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but with it's no it's both it runs both, both on the both. front end and the back end okay. yeah mm-hmm. uh, you were so people, close man. you were so close yeah <laughs> the way the easy you way to think about right. it is yeah exactly, yeah <laughs> The easy way to think about it is like you start off with an SPA. And again, I think about it from Ember because, you know, when SPAs first came out, like Trello, Trello didn't do like server side rendering because the value of Trello was not in like the pages showing up on Google or whatever. It was like you have to drag the boxes to lanes or whatever. Yeah. So then eventually you have that running. And then it's like, well, now we have different boards. What if we could pre render them so that when you first see it, you get the HTML, the browser can get to the first paint faster. And then mm. load the JavaScript, which can hydrate, which is like adding all the drag listeners to the elements right. that are already there. Yep. You know, that kind of thing. Right, so right, that right. so that's how it does both the front and the uh, back. But like tailandcss.com is a next site. Right. So they use next. Right. They used to be they used to be one of us and now they're they've abandoned us. Uh, they're way over on the dark side now. <laughs> they are on the dark side. They're all re- <laughs> all in on React. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I think I interrupted you there, right? So now Let's that we continue. don't know what next is, right. continue. <laughs> no, we know. We're right. totally solid. <laughs> so, yeah, I, uh, I was at NextConf last week, and I gave a talk on about React. But it was at NextConf because React just introduced some new APIs. React's really gone through, like, kind of three phases of, like, big architectural changes, I guess you'd say. Mm-hmm. They had the class components. And then they had hooks that let you just write function components. And then now they're introducing these APIs, server components and server actions that are kind of like this third phase of the paradigm, I guess. And Next.js is like the first framework to implement this new paradigm. So that's kind of what my talk was about. How Next is this like the future of React in Next today. Um, And all these are very new, but that's what it was about. It was about the paradigm. And so... 
So, so I react, can sum it just up. For our, like, just for our listeners, yeah. React yeah. added new primitives, <laughs> essentially. And then Next has implemented those primitives into something you can utilize. That seems right. So to speak. Yes. Okay. Yes. And the, the, the thing about server components and server actions, these new APIs, is that unlike previous APIs that have come to React, which were things like hooks, if you've ever seen like use state or use effect. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I know about use state. Those were... You don't know those were, about use I know state. about use state. <laughs> That's the part of React I actually know. Dude, I know you've been slinging some React. I, I know you like it. I know you got to tell... I'm the like, React fanboy on this I know podcast. you're the godfather. Yeah, yeah, I know yeah, you're yeah. the godfather of <laughs> Laravel, so you got to say you don't like React, but I know the no, real you. No, that's Aaron who like doesn't, doesn't like React. That's me. Yeah. Aaron doesn't like React. I, I don't like React. React. You said you didn't like React at the beginning. Me? Just saying. No, I like I React. I think you said that. Maybe you just don't like JavaScript. Yeah, I don't like JavaScript. I said I don't like JavaScript. I like React. I mean, if I have to use JavaScript, I like React over you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, nonsense. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I can sum up my talk basically in yep. uh, what you guys said earlier, which is you don't like implementing components, but you like using them. Which right. is why we all started using any front front end stuff because you want to go to Radix yeah. and grab a drop down because it's hoisted the hoisted by our own petards. Ian. He got <laughs> us. He was he was so ready for that. He was ready. Just throw it back in our so, face. So for the same reason that you all like using React and everyone does um, when they get to use a library that <laughs> solves their problem yes. and they don't have to implement Hold it. Hold on, Aaron. You do like it because you like your remotion, which is along these lines of a okay. thing you can remotion drop in. Remotion is very, very yes. good. There yes. we go. will, Even though that's, that's more of a full application more than the yes. component, but still. Yes. I agree. It's driving home the point. React yeah. enables really awesome abstractions on top of it, right? And there's a, re there's a reason that Remotion is written in React and not Vue because React's whole rendering model is effectively like frames. Every yeah. frame mm -hmm. per second or whatever, every render pass is a frame and the tree is guaranteed to be unique. And the way you change things is by making a new frame. It's how game engines work. And so tools like Remotion can exist because of the abstraction level of React. But, but it is extremely low level. And, you know, Aaron, I've heard you say, like, it feels like I don't need to know this stuff because I'm a fan of the pod. And I have a video from uh, two years, three years ago when I was learning React. And I basically say all that same stuff. I'm like, am I doing something wrong? I want to, like, load yes. data and render a page right. after I click a link. <laughs> this is ridiculous. I feel like I'm using the wrong tool. And that video is called... React is a programming language for UIs because I realize that React itself is really should be thought of more as a programming language, which means oh, that sure. application developers shouldn't be building apps with it. But there's this gap uh, with the framework ecosystem, which has nothing to do with like the floor and ceiling stuff. It just has to do with us not having a DHH or a tailor to glue all yes. these pieces together. Yeah. So I actually do, I'm totally I actually do on board with big... all of that. I think yeah, that's, that's a big a part, part of what's going on in the JavaScript ecosystem is you've got a few big companies with untold amounts of money and everybody's trying to like carve off their own portion of this massive ecosystem. And there's no one like editor curator that has extremely good taste. That's like, no, right. this is the way we're going to do it. Right. Yeah. And, exactly. so all, and so everybody just ends up fighting. Exactly. We need that omakase. I mean, DHH yes. is my dad. I'm a huge fan of conventions over configuration. Like I've been wanting that in the JavaScript ecosystem forever. And um, I'll be the first to say like, even the frameworks today that are uh, uh, the most mature in the React ecosystem don't have a dang model layer. They don't have a model it's, library. Like, like fat mind. controllers, skinny, fat models, skinny controllers, I think is one of the most important architectural takeaways from MVC. And Everyone brings their own model layer. It doesn't integrate with the controllers, and a lot of people don't even do that. So I think this is a huge gap in the application frameworks for React that has nothing to do with React as a UI library. Right. Um, but it's the reality if you are a front-end developer that um, you have to you have to piece those things together. And it's like you guys have said, like many people have said, it's a bad trade-off to make in a lot of situations where you just want to ship a product. So. I'm totally on board with that side of the of the critique for sure. Yeah. 
All right, I'm, so you're I'm the, trying to get Taylor to, to start Laravel JS, you know? Just <laughs> I mean, how bowl. many Lambos does a guy need? If he did that, <laughs> like, he could, he could consolidate so much power Consol- under himself. This is real Godfather stuff I'm, we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, seriously. Uh, we can't publish this now. This has to be backroom only. Right. No, we should, but yeah, we should get Taylor he, in here. He really could. Here's, a here's a quick, quick side note before we talk about how Sam is doing SQL injection live on stage. <laughs> right. Uh, what's the deal with the Adonis JS. Why does nobody use, love, or know Adonis JS? Which Never is basically see. That's that's what I don't understand. I, I've seen the name, but that's it, it. Is it is Laravel, but in JavaScript. But it's just yeah. not like I don't know what it is. Yeah. I don't know if they're bad at marketing oh, it's very, or very Laravel-y it's, in their example. It's almost it's one. It's almost a one to one copy of Laravel, but in mm. JavaScript. And I don't know if it's just mm-hmm. not sexy. Or there's no big company behind you know, it, or they're not that. like. People like they're not the um, good at marketing or something, but mm. this is the thing. It's like this is a fully featured, like you need to write actual back end code because you're mm-hmm. like building a real application. <laughs> I feel like Adonis is that, but you know, I feel I feel like a lot of the the JavaScript stuff that we see, especially in examples, is very infrastructure heavy and not very back end heavy. And so you'll see mm-hmm. stuff like. Hey, just call out to Superbase or call out to, you know, all these other hosted mm-hmm. providers and there is like a very very thin back end. And so maybe that's mm-hmm. a part of it is JavaScript developers yep. typically outsource the infrastructure which is becoming more full featured and so you just call APIs instead of having a back end. Right. Um I think, yes, I, I think that there's some of that is true. I also think maybe it could be just a cultural thing where um, maybe JavaScript developers, just the culture is not as on board with just getting on to other people's opinions. Maybe we just needed a different personality to scream at us for 10 years the way Dale, the, the way DHH did and say, mm-hmm. you know, your app is not unique. Um, and the things that are different that don't matter is way yep. better for us to just have one way to do it so you can move on. Um, on the, the back end as services thing, I will say like I had, I don't know if you all have ever had this and if you've ever done any significant SPA work, but I did have a very magical experience when me and Ryan were at the TED conference and Chris, the guy who owns TED said, I need an app so I can send messages to speakers uh, on stage and I need it in like, you know, half an hour. And I want to be able to write messages from my computer, show it to them because they always take too long or whatever. I want to be able to flash mm. it. I want to be able to show them their time left. And in like 13 minutes, me and Ryan created a Ember app and signed up for Firebase, which we had never yep, used at the time, go. and imported it. And we had an Ember app with two routes. One was like admin where he could type things and flash different times. And the other one was like the stage. And it was like the most magical developer mm-hmm. experience I'd ever had. And that was really significant for me because for the next several years, I was obsessed with this idea just like as a philosophy of like, okay, we need to go all in on the client and the back end needs to become as dumb as possible because mm-hmm. this enables this incredible thing. And I wasn't writing migrations and I wasn't, I didn't have to set up a day. I didn't have to do any, you know, I didn't have to do any of that. And I've been doing that for years. So um, that, that I think a lot of front end developers probably have, done something like that and has made them feel like it was only a matter of time before backend services became more and more commoditized and that the unique value offering was in the front end. And so we just want a tool and a setup that lets us just give me a CRUD interface. I can, I can do my extra logic here and go to town and I can get real time for free, all of those kinds of things. So I I think a lot of us have had experiences like that, which led us to that, but that makes if you sense. Zoom forward. I, I, I do the, feel like the Firebase yeah. thing is a big turning point where it's like, oh, the back end yes. is just there. I'll just call yes. an API and everything just happens. Do you feel yeah. like I feel like kind of touching on I do feel like I wonder if that's a an error. Like if that's incorrect. Or at least I think in some parts of the ecosystem that's incorrect and it's kind of interesting because it's like in the B2B land where I live, okay? Like the real the, world. The, the front end <laughs> is not at all anything the like that. Yeah, like because yeah. people use horrible, terrible, atrocious mm-hmm. front ends, right? And like mm-hmm. it's all about the back end and like the systems that integrate together 
and mm -hmm. whatever business logic -y kind of stuff's going on. Um, and the and, background process automation right, that's running 24 hours a day. That's yeah. doing whatever, right? And so uh, that's your that core does, offer. So you're not just going right. to shell that out to some some you, uh, you kind of can't job like i mean you can't. Yeah. it's hard yeah, anyway right. it's very hard it's not just like you just sign up and like it does the magical business logic you want right it's like yeah it's a it's, right it right. can abstract a database and store some data but it doesn't know what right. to do with that data right yes. so yep um so it's kind of interesting because i do feel like maybe that's part of the stuff you see around that people get annoyed at is like javascript sort of end of things where like people build these sort of consumer simpler apps it kind of pigeonholes you a little bit into that model of like where yes. a consumer app is defined more like that i do think that's true like the consumer app the front end is a bigger advantage um but then you are then limited in some of the other things you can maybe do so there is this idea of like yeah as react getting more into like back-end capability it's kind of interesting and maybe making it easier to open up some of those more complicated uh applications Yes. Yeah, my, so my, my is question different. is always like when I see, you know, abstract, you know, back end as a service, I'm like, all right, well, where do you generate your CSV reports and zip them up and FTP them every night at right. midnight? Because that's like a process. That's yeah. a process that, you know, these, you know, these dirty B2B SaaS apps right. have to do. It's like, well, we have to send this file to the local county government every morning at 6 a.m. Like that's an yeah. actual thing I used to have to do. Right. And writing all of that stuff in some like some no code or like right. by cobbling together some APIs, I'm like, I don't even know where I would get started with that. And that's the yep. mental gap for me is where do you guys yep. write all, where do you put all your, your actual logic stuff? Right. Yep. So that was both, that was a great segue into the talk. And yeah, there we go. Um, I We're also professionals. Agree. We're good at this. <laughs> so of course it's a good segue. Not, yeah. It's not your first time. It's not your first time. Um, Ian, you said, I think this is an error. And I actually agree with you. And I think a lot of us do. So in the case of my app, my little stage presenter app at TED, it was perfect because right. I didn't run up against the constraints of Firebase, right? And the APIs it happened to have served our needs perfectly. And so it was a great solution for it. Um, but uh, exactly like you guys say, you run into this boundary. So this is where it's like if you invert the ceiling and floor thing and the ceiling is now getting how much back here I, I know this is getting crazy <laughs> i'm just and it just came to me right now so just just roll with it i'll keep going i love right. it keep going it, if the ceiling is not how high the ui can be the, the 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 maximum capabilities for your ui but the ceiling is the maximum capabilities for your servers your server side code and everything you could possibly do in a server environment that had access to all the APIs that a server side language does, then right. it's actually the same problem. Because if you're using APIs from your React app, then you have a lower ceiling. And then you have us doing Rails and people doing Laravel and Rails saying, well, what if, what if my database doesn't let me wrap up all my data into a CSV report and schedule a job at 6, 6 a.m. every day? Then you've hit you've hit a limit, and so folks like that, like you guys, and me in the past, have wanted to make sure we could do everything we could because if I'm writing Rails, I can do that. I've done exactly mm. what you said with Rails. We had to do that kind of thing with Ember Map, and we had a Rails server, so we could do that. But now that we don't have a separate server, we have to use another service to mm -hmm. you know do X and Y and Z. And um, I think exactly right is that that kind of middle sam perspective of like the middle age like the it's like the develop it's like the the mm. meme what is it the the oh, midwit the, top wit, yeah the middle curve yeah. yeah exactly yeah. the first the left side of the midwit is write all your server code and all your javascript code you know javascript's best at handling the client and server's code is best at handling the server midwit is mm -hmm. oh we just need a fat fat client app and we can just delegate all backend services. And then the Jedi is like, no, write all your server code in your server side and client and the client side. So yes. exactly for these reasons, um, React introduced server components and server actions. And so what they do is, um, just like you guys said, the best part of using React is just rendering the component and not implementing it. But because React runs on the client and has access to the entire set of browser APIs, 
then you can package those APIs up into a React component. And so when you render a modal, you know, with Radix, it can animate up, it can attach a, a keyboard listener so that when you hit escape, then it closes it. It can attach a click listener so that if you click outside the element, it dismisses it and it can trap focus and it can do anything that you need it to do because it is running in the browser. It's not an abstraction on top of JavaScript, blah, 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 but it's packaged up in the React component interface. And that makes it fun for you to use and easy for you to use. And it makes it composable with other React components. So server components okay. and server actions are doing exactly the same thing, but for server side. Okay. Code. Well, hang on. All right. So I had you, I had you at modals. I had you at click events, trapping, packaging that all makes sense to me packages up a really complex modals for example combo boxes for example incredibly complex just hysterical mm -hmm. but when you package it up into a react component you get this nice little surface area of like well here's the thing i want you to show when you click great nice awesome love it good packaging good developer experience server actions and server components how is that the same? And what is like the, what is the thing that is being packaged? Is it server side code? Yes. Hmm. Much to consider. Okay. Tell so, me, tell me, <laughs> tell me more. So consider, <laughs> consider a Laravel app that serves a list, a table of users when you visit the homepage. Okay. Easy. Got it. So you define an index route, you hit, you make mm -hmm. a request, the request comes in, the top of the controller starts running. The controller fetches the data using Eloquent from your database, right? It's an, mm -hmm. it's, Man, it's an, speaking my language, yeah. It's an async <laughs> function, right? So when PHP runs, it runs, you know, steps can take a long time, right? JavaScript normally is not like this, but it has async await, and in the server-side context, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So you await, okay. you, you, you fetch the data from the database, and then you pass that data as an instance variable to a view, um, to blade template, mm -hmm. and you render the user table, and then Laravel responds. Flawless, love it. That's, that's the model. <laughs> what else we should you do want? that, yeah. And the, and the podcast right here. <laughs> <laughs> problem solved. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. If this is the before, we don't need an after. That's amazing. All right, keep going. <laughs> so uh, then, then Rails or uh, Laravel takes the blade template, compiles it in HTML, Packages it up in HTTP response, responds to the browser, and the browser renders it. So everything I okay. just described can be packaged up. You can think of it as rendering a user table. If I were to render a user table, a server-side user table as a React component, then you could put all those steps inside. But if I want to render it, then I could just render it. And if you're using mm -hmm. this new architecture, this new paradigm, then you have an index route that support that, that renders, that serves up a user's table. But when it's rendered on the server, it does all of those steps and it does exactly the same thing that the Laravel app does. Does it actually go all the way through to rendering the HTML on the server and then spitting out the complete HTML? Yes. Or does it, okay. It does more than that, but that is the right way to think about it right that now. Is. Okay. Okay, so Maybe why would you do that? Did you this? get all that? Did you get that, Ian? <laughs> I got it. I, I do okay, have it. okay, okay. Tell, explain it. Explain it back to me, Ian, because the thing I didn't get was, yeah. like, I, I got the whole render pipeline, but then it was like, if you want to render, now you have a function. I didn't get that part. So what happens? I mean, I think it's just like if you were to think. It's it's basically. It's just doing it server side like Laravel would do it, but now it's executing. You know, you could bundle up a custom Laravel component that, like, or Livewire full page component that, like, receives the HTTP request and then does whatever database stuff it needs to do, and then renders the HTML and then spits that back to the browser. That could all be in one like. Okay, so we're saying a React Livewire, server component. Example. A React server component is much like the Laravel blade wow, handler. rendering yeah. yes. model. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's in that start it does it all on the server. The server. It does it yeah. all on the server and only on the server. This component only ever renders on the server. It only ever executes the body of the of the function, the steps, 
the await, the connection to the database, the processing of the blade template. It's in the server Got it. with request okay. and response. It's a single step, doot, 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 and then it has a response. It's not re-rendering the way React okay. does on the client. And your, you all's name for this is server. This would be a server component. Yes. Yep. Which is different than a server action, which we'll talk yes. about, I assume, at some point. But yep. this is a server component. Got exactly. it. Okay. Yep. Cool. Got it. All right. Carry on. So why would you want to do this, right? Why would you want to package up rendering a user table from a database in the React component interface? Well... For, for one reason, um, like you guys were saying, people like using React components. They're easy. They look should've like never, HTML. Should have never said it. Should have <laughs> never said it. <laughs> they look a lot like HTML. You invoke them with angle brackets, and you can customize mm -hmm. them by passing props in the same way that you render HTML elements okay. and customize them by passing attributes. And you can nest them, right? In React, it's called children. Um, but you know, and uh, it's just nested HTML elements, I guess, in, in HTML. And of course, this was all inspired by HTML so that it was familiar and felt fun to use for web developers. So that's where mm -hmm. the component interface came from. But it proved to be a really useful way to expose APIs. And again, over time, we can write that modal today as a single component, which it really doesn't get much easier. I mean, it's basically what you would imagine it being if it if and when a modal does come to HTML, right? How would HTML give you a modal to use? They would give you a modal and you would invoke it. You wouldn't like set up a portal in the top of your app to make sure it renders correctly with a Z index on top of this. You wouldn't have to write more JavaScript to attach it to make sure that it listens for keyboard clicks and mouse clicks. It would just all be contained in that interface, right? So at this point, we have all of those tools like use effect and use state and React portals that enable an abstraction like a modal to just all be self-contained. So the goal with server actions and server components is to do the same thing. So why would you wrap up rendering a user table on the server side into a component? Well, for the same reasons that we wanted to do that with modal. Because if I have a user table, now how do I customize it? Well, maybe I can pass in a filter prop or a sort prop. And it's just like passing a prop to a React component. I see. Which is powerful. This is all, now, just to get super old school on you guys for a second, this is all the same stuff that Cold Fusion had, like, literally 25 years ago. And I miss Cold Fusion all the time because, like, we've just been reinventing Cold Fusion for the past 25 years. And it's very funny to me because it was, like, just a graph tag. You drop a graph tag mm -hmm. in, and it gives you a graph. Mm -hmm. And you can pass a query into mm -hmm. the graph tag as a prompt. Mm -hmm. And you get that data graphed and like we're just all we're, we're getting back to what we had 25 years ago we're, there's we're always there's always a get off my lawn moment <laughs> or like an old man yells at cloud <laughs> moment and it's this always it's always very fun yeah, so yeah it's cold we're all back to cold fusion somehow we're getting there we're getting there but anyway okay so, so the packaging yeah we're so it's, organizing. Pa it's, it's about pa so so in the same way that the client components which they're now called which have have been called react components mm -hmm. up to this point because there was no other that there's not more right. than one kind, but now y'all have got to work on this naming. <laughs> Naming's yeah, this, this is, is this not is Otwell. wild. This naming is not Otwell no. at all. We need to get. They should pay Taylor an ungodly sum of money there to just go. come in and like fix the naming. There you go. That yes, go and once so, once so you online. name something, you you got to live with it. Yep. So you got to yeah. think ahead because if you're going to be changing all these names all the time, <laughs> people are going to get confused. Um, okay, but yeah. So uh, in the same way that um, yeah, basically. The APIs that let us wrap up the browser APIs and the client-side JavaScript that we want to write behind the React component interface, that's what these server components are doing. But the implementation of the server-side components is running on the server, it's in the server, and so you don't hit that ceiling anymore. And now you can author any server-side code you want and still put it inside of your React app, right? So again, just that was just kind of making that point back to the, the getting rid of the backend as a service thing. This, this, this is solving, wrapping that logic up into the component interface because A, it's fun and easy to use. It's familiar for web developers. It works well in the client. Um, 
B, because it's the same component interface, this is really the key point of this whole architecture, it composes with your client components. So we don't have to get into the details here, but this is kind of like, to your point about, well, we have inertia, and inertia lets us write client-side JavaScript without limits on the front end, and PHP mm-hmm. without limits on the back end, and it wires them together. Isn't that great? Why do we need anything else? Because there's no limit in either environment. And it is true, basically, that when you're building a modern web experience, you basically do have two apps that you're building, right? You have two apps. You have a server that is a re- handling requests. It's dealing with requests and response, and it's stateless. It's a stateless server, and it just handles and spits it out. And then you have a client app that is a long-lived stateful app that has a session. You know, it's, it's, it's not an HTTP session, but it has state associated with it over time. It's long-lived. It's like an iPhone app. But you need both these things to work together to deliver like a modern, you know, what people do on the web these days. And so something like Inertia does help you write these two apps and tries to abstract away as much of the communication as possible. The reason React server components are different from just that is because since they are both wrapped, both the client side features and the server side features are wrapped in the same component interface, you can compose them together. And so now you can have a user table that fetches data from the database and renders you know, an HTML table with dynamic data. And if you want to put it in a modal, then you just wrap it in a modal. You just, it's, it's a, it's okay. a, it's a JSX file. Right. It's a react. It's your page is a JSX page and you just import modal from Radix and you wrap it. And now your server side rendered server side generated user table is going to show up in a modal with all of the client behavior that that modal has once, once react kicks in on the client. So that is like, that is the point of the whole paradigm basically. Right. So you end up with like a React, a JSX file that has things that are going to execute on the server, tags that are going to execute on the server, and other tags that are going to execute on the client, but it's just one HTML looking page. Exactly. It's and a single React tree. The React, whatever side of it's working at that moment is going to do the right thing with the correct tags. Exactly. And leave the other stuff alone. Um, and it, so it's basically cold fusion. That's, the short, that's, <laughs> that's the short basically PHP. <laughs> it's PHP. Uh, but that's no, what, it's a PHP. It's all, it's uh, what a blade file. It's just what a blade file is. No, ha, ha, it's, it's just we separate ours by language, right? So you right. have a blade you file, and it's like, well, this languages. part's going to render on the server because it's PHP, and this part's right. going to render on the client because it's JavaScript. Right. This, so, way, you, it, this goes all the way back to like, I just want to stay in JavaScript, right? Yeah. Like, if I just want to stay in JavaScript, then I can just stay in React and JavaScript and not go between those two languages or whatever. But yeah. You'll still have to learn all those same concepts. And obviously, at some point, they'll be queuing and sending emails and whatever. I don't know if those things exist yet in the React server-side stuff, but at some point, they will, whether mm-hmm. it's in a framework or in the core or whatever. Sure. And people have to learn what that is and all the sharp edges and all that stuff, uh, too. But, yeah, I, I get it. So okay, I get so. it. I get it. So React server components, I get it. I I see the appeal. It makes sense to me. I still think there's this entire chasm missing of like all the business logic and stuff. But in terms of like creating views and interfaces and stuff that like the actual view layer, React server components sound reasonable to me. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I I get that. Could they, I mean, are the components structured in such a way that the component, you would have components that are your business logic? Yes. Yeah, so, so this so, is the thing. Right? So, no. <laughs> no. No. I'm, 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 I was I'm, trying. I'm holding your hand, I was man. Too far. I'm, I'm taking, I'm taking my time. Holding your hand. No. I'm trying to get you there. No. So I appreciate not... you coming on today. It's been fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just about the view and rendering. So, um, Yes, you need business logic, and yes, the JavaScript server-side ecosystem doesn't have as mature a set of libraries to do all the things. Like, I remember my, one of my first Rails side projects with my brother was, it, email, it was called, like, callyourmom.com, and uh, you would set up an email reminder system, and you could put it on a schedule. And so you say, I want to call my mom every week, and uh, I would get an email every week, and I could say, call my Aunt Julia every three months, and remind me every morning to, you know, take, drink water or whatever. And there was this like recurrence library in Ruby and uh, it let us just do mm-hmm. all that stuff. And that's not going to be something that you get by using like a web service. And um, again, the point of server components 
is not, it's not at the same level as MVC or application architecture concerns. It is trying to let folks who are building those abstractions and libraries and packages wrap them up into the, the same interface so that they're easier to use in the same way that React libraries on, on the client, UI libraries, all wrap up their modals and their drop downs and their dialogues into a component so they're easy to use and they play well with the rest of the React ecosystem. So um, that is the goal of server components. It is a, it's a tool for, to, to, it, it's, a, it's a building block. It's like a missing primitive, you could say, in React that allows you to package up whatever you're doing on the server in a, e a way that's easier and, fun and more fun to use, honestly, just like, again, rendering a modal. So we talked about user table. That renders it. It's a view logic. You're like, that's fine. What about the business concerns? So this is the thing. This is where server actions come in. And this is the SQL injection slide. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> All okay. right. We're almost there. There we go. Yeah. Insert into bookmarks. <laughs> that's right. So <laughs> in the talk, I'm explaining how to make like a news story you know it's like a it's like a magazine or whatever it has like it was apple news i was mm -hmm. clipping things from apple news um i got like a midnight the night before my talk as i was frantically trying to finish my keynotes and um mm -hmm. you have your articles and then you want to add something that does like a mutation you know which what's common way people call it these days in front end but it's just you want to write back to the database or you want to trigger an email or whatever so in this case you want to write back to the database you click the bookmark and you want to get the current user from the session and then save this bookmark to their back end. So you add a bookmark and normally you might have an on click and this is where you kind of get out of the react tree, the UI and you hit an API endpoint uh, or like this is what inertia would do, right? Inertia, you would on click. And then that routes you, inertia is going to route you to some server side controller, let's say. That's like an action. It's like a, yep. it's a create, it's a post on the bookmarks controller, mm -hmm. something like that, right? And mm -hmm. so when you click that, you make an API request. It sends a post message to slash bookmarks. And then you write your PHP code that says insert into bookmarks and then return success true. That goes back to the client. And then you can say, oh, it's pending. Oh, it's good to go. Yeah. Okay, it's saved. And then you re-render it. And, that's uh, awesome. <laughs> I love it. So that's exactly. As in fact, that's exactly what I would do. So yeah, beautiful. Nailed so it. What, yeah. <laughs> so what's the pro what's the pro what's the problem with this? Um, no, no problem. <laughs> no, no. You can't set me up like that. No problem. <laughs> no problem. It's all perfect. So it, 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 the way it's th the way I think about it is. Again, do you guys know what React portals are where they like create something? I think Vue, they all have this now where if you need to make a drop down or, or a modal, you, like jump you need around to jump in around the DOM, the DOM to different parts. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, For sure. Before all these front end frameworks had the ability to do that, then to use a modal, there was always a second step, right? You had to set up that part, that container and give it like an ID to this thing. It's like, it's like spooky a action at a distance. Right, because you have the modal here, but you actually have the modal container somewhere up here. So if I want to copy the modal and use it again, I have to be aware of it. Actually, has an implicit dependency, or maybe an explicit dependency, right. but it has a dependency outside of the component boundary. So I can't just copy and paste the modal around. So if you think about the button right. in the Inertia app, if I wanted to copy a bookmark button into a new place, do I just copy the bookmark? Well, what is the dependency there? There, there's a dependency on the API server and the, the specific route that it's hitting for it all to work, for the mm -hmm. full stack feature mm -hmm. to actually work. So the action has leaked outside of the component boundary. And so we lose the benefits of that packaging, that slim interface. And you can't, just, you can't copy it around your app as easy, maybe whatever, right? So that's, that's like the goal. So server actions... fix that problem. You can think of a server action as in, in your, in your view template, instead of making a request to an endpoint and then that endpoint hitting a controller in your Laravel app that runs the post method. What if you could import that mm -hmm. post method? What if you could have a, what if your bookmark component could import post from bookmarks controller and say mm -hmm. on submit equals, bookmarks controller dot post 
and then you export that. So you're carrying around you're carrying around the the action with the UI exactly. or I guess the component. Exactly. And now if you have that inside of the component and you export that and share that, I can copy your bookmark component and render it. And when I submit it, it's just going to use that code because it's importing it directly. It's like uh, Livewire Vault. It's like what Taylor is trying to do with Vault. Like you have the lo business logic, let's say, the server-side code at the top of the file, and you have the HTML at the bottom of the file. It's all one file. You could take that file and move it around, and it would all exactly. work exactly the same. Um, and then yeah. the things that... Like that. So is the, is the primary benefit... Because I haven't seen anybody talk about the primary benefit. I've just seen people talk about how cool it is. I'm like, I don't get it. So is the primary benefit this thing you're describing here where everything is, is co-located together in terms of like the front end initiator and the back end responder are all kind of together in the same actual yes. file? So in this case, there actually is no front end code. So in my example, so I was kind of talking to you through this case of <laughs> of the inertia app where the inertia app has okay. the view app running on the client right and Great. then when you press a button it's like an spa mode and it's going to use a fetch request to hit the api endpoint right yes so mm -hmm. what if instead your inertia view like rendering ui layer never started running view on the front end and it just pre-rendered that button on the server and had HTML, right? And then when you submit the form, it makes like an HTTP request, but the form has like an action pointing to a specific route that your server can route to this, to run the code that you imported and attached directly, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is, this is, the, bun this exactly. is the bundler thing where what you're writing is not what is being- Served up. Uh, not the form in which it's exactly. being served. And so it's like if you could import that post con that bookmarks controller dot post method and then you had a server endpoint in your Laravel app that was like slash actions and anytime your front end makes a request to it, even an HTTP request, but let's just let's just say an Ajax request or whatever. Um, because that doesn't really matter. It's not running on the client. It goes to that endpoint mm -hmm. and then your your server is able to look up, oh when they make a request to actions with these, this like ID or something, we get the bookmarks controller dot post method. We run that code on the server and then we return the result. And, um, now your bookmark, now so your it's bookmark like deconstructing yeah, yes, it for but you. The bookmark now doesn't have any of that spooky action at a di distance. If you were to put that bookmark component, that had the server action, like it could be importing it from the file, or could just be right there, because you know in JavaScript it's all JavaScript, so you could you could write that there. That's what like that use server directive is. But either way, mm -hmm. the, conceptually it's the same thing. If you could put it all inside of that bookmark component, then you could share it, and anytime someone rendered it with the angle brackets, they'd be getting the server side logic for the mutation, right? Which could have a direct handle to a database because it's running only in the server, and um, that's it. So you've, you've put all of those concerns inside the boundary. And so now you can just render the component and it can basically come bundled with the server side mutation that it needs to do to work. You don't need to make sure there's an API server set up or whatever. Right. So that's, that's the idea. And, um, well, yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Do you, I don't know. Ian, I, I, I guess my only thing with sense. it yeah. is does, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it makes sense and all the, that part of it i do wonder like do you think it's like a practice i haven't dug like super deep into the actual like api of it but is it a practical thing because there's like there's like okay let's put some sql here to insert right a bookmark row great like that's very straightforward it's a single line fine but then you get into like a real application that's got like well we have to authorize can this person even do this and then we have to try to insert it but what if it fails and maybe we have some other case and that so like that it's actually like 20 sure. lines of code is like the real amount of code you'd actually need to do this like does it start to break down when you get into like that type of a real world implementation as opposed to like 
the conference talk sure, implementation sure. of like, yeah, we didn't do some the line of SQL and it, that's cool and it yep. inserts like. I guess uh, how does that look when you when you actually yep. build a more real? So action? to bring it to the example in in the talk, I was building this bookmark on this Travis Kelsey Taylor Swift slide and uh, wanted to bookmark it to save it. Classic. And so yeah, originally Obviously. we had an API endpoint that cr inserted the bookmark, and the, and the button was making an AJAX request to that A point. Then I show how. This is like a coupling here, and if we can just import the action and put it directly in here, then we've encapsulated all the logic inside the bookmark component, right? And um, first of all, all that is rendering and the server action is executing on the server. So it's not, it does hydrate and it ends up using Ajax, but that's kind of besides the point because um, the SQL code that ran is actually it's like a template tag literal so it was never running on the client because some folks were looking at the the slide that was going around twitter and saying like you're you're you're, you're running this like code on the client that's not what was happening because it was a server action and the, right. the sql tag function sanitizes the input so there was no injection either it's it, it the function actually it was running yeah. that through a function but so that setting that aside that was just fun i mean it was, it was just for fun right i mean i was making a simple right. point yeah. but there's no injection and you're not running sql on the client but to your point about the application concerns and the maintainability and the scalability of it one way to think about this is like before we were just writing api endpoints so that these things talk to each other and we used things like inertia to try to minimize how much of that we even have to think about I just really want to run this server side code mm -hmm. when I sub click on this button and inertia has a way for me to do that. I can do that by myself. And this is like one step further. It's just removing that conceptually altogether so that you can just import a function and invoke it the same way you would anywhere in your program. So, mm -hmm. and then elsewhere. Exactly. Is so the function the that you run function. when you submit yeah. the form or click the button, we're removing, we've removed this network, the, the details of how to pass the arguments and call it in response to an event um, because that was a technological limitation that we didn't have before. So now we remove that limitation so that we can just pass functions. But when it comes to things like design, like code design and maintainability and reuse, all of the lessons still apply from before. So again, going back to my Rails days, uh, fat models, skinny controllers. If you have a controller that's a couple lines long, Make sure there's a current user, try to insert it, return an error. If not, otherwise render the success or whatever, um, the new, the new to do you created or the new post. That's fine. That's like a couple of lines of code. Yeah. Throw that in your, in your uh, post method of your rails app. But as your app grows, like you said, there's more and more logic and people's controller methods did get really long and that was messy and hard to maintain. And the answer was fat model skinny controller. So you create domain objects so that your controller just says something like send an email. And then, you know, it's like a, e a mailer dot send this message here. The mailer class has the logic and that's somewhere else. And it knows how to connect to AWS or whatever. And it knows how to turn this into the right format and actually send it or enqueue a job if that's what it needs to do because it's a mailer and then it returns a success. So your controller would still be slim. And so again, it's not really, it's, it's a different level than MVC, but as folks use this, it's, you, you can bring all of that design print. So instead of SQL, obviously you would probably use like, I like ORM. So I would use an ORM there. And then if the logic became more complicated, you could extract it into these kind of domain objects for the, for the sake of maintainability and, and clarity, but, uh, server components. Yes. All right. So let yeah. me, let me, let me try mm -hmm. this on you. So let, let me try this react server action is the controller. Yes level layer portion slice exactly coupled with coupled with some sort of uh view or initiator or whatever whether that's a you know react client or a react client component or a react server component yes you know, regardless you bundle it all together and now your your view and your controller are nice and neat and coupled, not in a bad way, but like in a way that you can carry them around together. Exactly. What is still missing 
that is yet to be like either talked about very much or invented is the rest of like the the model layer the fat models right. the cues right. all of like the actual you know under iceberg part of like the business logic right and so what i'm i think i think that is probably the answer to my main question which yes. is like why would anyone do this yeah. this feels like <laughs> this this feels like terrible spaghetti but the answer is not the answer is not you're going to shove all your logic in your views exactly. the answer is you're going to have bookmark service or bookmark model dot create you're gonna exactly. have one or two or three lines that would be more analogous to a controller exactly. than it is your entire domain's logic that should still be someone else and we need somebody exactly. in the javascript ecosystem to champion that and teach everybody put all of this in a reasonable place not in your react server action yes exactly that's, I'm glad you said that because that's a great analogy. Imagine, so right now when you have methods in your Laravel controller, um, you have controller methods in your Laravel app, how do you hit them? You have to make an HTTP request to them somehow. Mm -hmm. You click a link or you submit a form. If you're not using JavaScript, links and forms are the only way that the browser, your browser, can interact with your Laravel app. Mm -hmm. What if you could so write on years. hover, what if you could write on hover, run this, controller post method or bookmarks create method. And you just had a way in PHP to do that so that you could just, Livewire. right? That's, yeah, that's, Livewire. that's like, that's, that is, but that's, that's, that's the, the appeal idea. of Livewire. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's mm -hmm. the appeal. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's why we like it. Um, yeah. so anyways, that, that, that's, that's kind of the idea. That's, that's kind of the idea. But, um, yes, in, in terms and of, are there, are there, I was just gonna ask: Are there people working on like? Is there an ORM already, or are there? Yeah, are there yeah there's other seven components? ORMs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, yeah. There's an ORM for every day of the week, man. Yeah, yeah. So the model layer out is, there. I think, um, going back to earlier, the model layer is the thing that the biggest missing piece in terms of a coherent one. Um, Prisma is pretty good, um, and it has a lot. It has re relational ideas of relations relationships and foreign mm -hmm. keys and you know transactions and all that stuff and i will say like you do do less in the back end like even when we had our full rails app serving up for ember map and we weren't trying to get rid of the back end and only make an ember app right we had a full rails app which was great when you had to do anything custom a lot of the stuff that you used to do, you would do more stuff on the client because it's interactive. You want to filter it fast down or whatever. And um, a lot of the, it, it feels like these days I need the full power less, way less often than when I was writing Rails apps, let's just say. But anyways, that, setting that aside, um, there are tons of libraries in the Node ecosystem that let you organize. I mean, the there's lots of, yeah, there's lots of really, huge node apps that are well designed yeah. from an object oriented, you know, separation of concerns, maintainability perspective. Um, but because react server components is not trying to solve that problem, they're trying to give you a primitive that lets you distribute these Interact in a way that, that composes stuff. because yeah. so far everyone's been doing server side data fetching in their own way. And so I can't right. bring down these components and add them. I have to use my framework specific ways to fetch data and to write data. That's the problem they're trying to solve, but there's mm. definitely still problems in the model layer that need to be solved. Um, and so kind of how I end the talk actually is talking about like what this future would look like. And so um, imagine like, you could have, if you had a form library that was opinionated about your database design in the way, I'm sure there's like form four helpers, something equivalent to form four from Rails and Laravel, where the form helpers in Laravel comprehend your models and relationships, right? So if you need to create a form to create, you know, a user with three to do's, like the form helpers n map it to your database so that you can render it you type in the data and you hit submit and it knows how to take the graph of data from the form in the HTML and map it to the right places in your databases, setting up the foreign keys. That only is as coherent and consistent because all of those abstractions know about the other ones. You have to have eloquent, you have to have a database that has foreign keys and you have to have a form helper that makes assumptions about 
the name of the model and what data it, it gets, right? And so that's, that's incredible, it's super powerful. So what would that look like in React? Well, you could have basically the same thing. So you could render a form, input a component. You could say like, this is like user.firstName and I could just render that. Let's say I just bring in Postgres and an ORM like Prisma and now there's like a Prisma, like there's like a, a form library that works. That's like, those three are a package together. That's one package, it's a new library. I install that. It tells me how to set up my database in the same way Rails would. And it gives me form components that let me render those. This is a cool thing. So now I render a form and I say, I say input type email and where's the data coming from? Again, it's a server component. So I just pass in props. I say user.find one basically, but it's just one user ID one. So just rendering email input with user ID one and field password, I get server side rendering. It fetches the database and it waits it and it does it again. It's HTTP request and response. So the first time you load that it's doing it. So you get HTML from the server, right? And it renders that data from the database right there. I didn't have to set anything else literally as easy as rendering a modal and it does all of that. Then the react app starts running on the client because it does hydrate in any client behavior you have. I put my cursor in the input and I add a character. I type in a, and this input has, um, a listener for keyboard events. And as soon as it changes, it also has a server action that knows how to update that field in the database. And it renders a spinner while that's happening on the client. And it's all in that component. So that is like the dream, right? All of this functionality end to end, a complete end to end feature can be packaged inside of a component. And the more opinions that these people have about your architecture, the more powerful and rails like and Laravel, like these abstractions will become. But even with third party services, like adding Stripe to your app, with Stripe, maybe you have a UI component, but you're also used to, okay, now we got to set up the server side component. If they make a server component that has server actions, you could just render Stripe checkout, just the way you render modal, and that's it. That's all you have to do. Right, it's all be maybe, connected. And, yeah. and again, it can have access to environment secrets because it's running on the server, so maybe there's an environment variable that it uses. It, it's all encapsulated in the, in the component boundary. So that to me is like, that's kind of the dream, right? It's kind of like one way you could say this is like, I love using Tailwind UI components and Radix components, modals and drop downs, and you know, going to town on the UI. It's easy. It's fun. It's like the easiest and funnest part of my job, right? What if you could build a whole app out of React components? That's like, that's one way to think about all right, this. Just kind of piecing it together. And um, all the details, too much. just like inertia abstracted some of the details between client and server communication, these really take it another level because it's just, it's just components and composition. And there's like, there's more cool stuff that comes out of this model, but that is really, that's kind of the way I'm thinking about it. So. Okay. So you're ready for my hot take on yes, that? Yes, I'm ready. Hot I'm take. ready. Let's go. Here, here's my hot take on that. That sounds awesome. Nobody, you said that's the dream. And you said if this, you know, library did exist or whatever, I think my hot take on that is somebody needs to, somebody needs to have those opinions and enforce them because what you described of, oh, if there was this library that had like, you know, Prisma and Postgres and a form all kind of wrapped up together. Well, the, what is, what's going to happen is people are going to be like, well, I want to use drizzle. Yeah. I want to use drizzle mm -hmm. with it. I want to use Kaisley with it. I want to use my SQL. I want to use SQLite. And then suddenly you're back to this situation where you are inventing from scratch or maybe you're inventing from eight different, you know, well battle tested libraries, you're inventing your own meta framework where you're then maintaining like, oh, okay, well I have this form field thing that interacts, you know, with my Prisma. Prisma just upgraded to 5.0, so I gotta make sure that my form field thing is and so what I think needs to happen and what could make someone fabulously wealthy if they could pull it off correctly, is they could take all of those good opinions that you just shared and say this is the way we do it. And like kind of the thing that I feel like Laravel did so well was it does use, you know, it does use third party libraries very heavily under the hood. Like our, you know, file system, our cloud file system thing is built on top of 
I think it's called Fly System. Mm -hmm. But it's like, yeah, you don't actually need to know that Fly System really exists. You just use Laravel's file system, right? And our HTTP, you know, request response is built on top of Symfony's HTTP classes. And it's like, well, yeah, you don't really need to know that those exist. But the great thing that we get out of that is that our models and our queues and our uh, controllers and our scheduling, they all know about each other. And so everything works exactly as you're describing. The thing that's missing, I think, on y'all's side is that one that one like one set of opinions that's like you you're gonna use you have to use Prisma. In fact you may not even know you're using Prisma because yes. we've built you we've built a, a single you know? a single opinionated interface on top of all of these really good libraries. Right. But now you're using, you know, you're using Sam Avell or whatever you want to name well, your thing. But like somebody has to make those decisions for it, you. It seems like this provides the tool to exactly. even allow that to exist. Exactly. Right? So, Before it would be very hard for that to exist, whereas now it can be organized in such a way that it could exist. Yes. I so think we'll I think this is out of that. Exactly. Perfectly. Like this from React's perspective, the, the library maintainers and designers, this was a missing primitive for that level of composition behind a set of opinions and that could also wrap the server side actions and rendering and fetching inside of the same component interface. So that is my hope that it will provide that. I don't think that excuses the JavaScript community for the last 10 years of not having stronger opinions because you didn't need server components and actions. You didn't need to build an app out of components, yeah. even if it's enables some really amazing things that we weren't able to do with any other technology, like putting the user table in the modal, in the same tree, in the same file. Like mm -hmm. there's no other technology that lets you do that. Um, but uh, that's not an excuse for not having more opinions because people did spend a lot of time wheel reinventing. But um, that is, I think, where we're going to head because in the same way that we render a modal and we don't care, let's say the modal has collision detection. And so if you're at the bottom of the screen, it'll render on top. You know, there's some mm -hmm. hook underneath, like use window width or use window height that it's using. And when those first came out, people had strong opinions about them. Now they're packaged inside of the modal, and so we don't care. So if you get the abstraction right, then people don't care about those low-level things. And they're not going to say, I want to use Drizzle and not Prisma, right? So yes. um, that's, that, is the hope. that is the goal. At least from my perspective, that's what I want to see. That's what a lot of us want to see. So, so just going to wrap it up here since yeah. we're gone this is, we're gonna have like uh six hours of podcast this week. but um but uh you know one thing i did want to just touch on is like you, normally when you become the main character on twitter it's terrible like you don't want to become the main character on twitter it's horrible but i feel like you've actually you kind of like this worked out not so bad for you because like the idea got a lot of criticism exactly but then people were also having fun with it and i don't think mm -hmm. i saw anybody like complain about you at all no like, they weren't like no. the sam guy's no. an idiot they were just no. like it was a blast it was great so i thought that was really cool it was yeah. fun people kept, people kept messaging of fun me. with the memes yeah exactly people kept messaging me over the weekend like they're like are you okay i hope you're doing all right with this i was like are you kidding this is a, this is hilarious <laughs> like yeah i did not take any that of it personal so i mean people are like these guys are idiots or whatever i mean it doesn't For sure yeah it, in the abstract it, it, yeah. i liked it a lot of people were curious about it i think a lot of people will be interested in the talk because of it so that's great you know i had i had yeah, no I mean, problem sometimes with it all. generating hey you're on here because of it right like, yeah you wouldn't yeah, exactly. necessarily have a react episode right but it's like oh there's like this thing going on and people are getting upset by it but it's like kind of cool to talk about and, yeah learn more about it and that's what we've done so yeah. um all right man well thanks for coming on really appreciate it uh since this definitely... is going on two feeds we should say where each feed can be found yes. in case we want to yes. cross pollinate listeners Perfect. exactly you go so first. sam why don't you where's where, all right i'll go first so um <laughs> obviously you can find us on uh mostly mostly tech pod oh my goodness I this know, is our I'm first podcast right. episode ever mostly apparently. tech pod at twitter mostly technical.com you can email us at mostly technical podcast at gmail.com. Um, and definitely I'll just give a thing for Sam here too, to check out build UI, which is his, uh, screen, uh, video courses course on react front video end. courses on react and, uh, tailwind and other tech along those lines. So definitely check that out. Thanks. Man. Um, and yeah, Sam, why don't you say where you can, you can find your, uh, podcast. Yeah. So we'll put this on front end first. 
and that's mine and Ryan's podcast. We Good do day. some interviews, but mostly just us talking about kind of what we're working on. So frontendfirst.fm is our website. And um, yeah, I'm excited to have helped make the Mostly Technical podcast a little more technical. This might be your most technical episode ever, this, actually. This is by <laughs> far our most technical. Definitely. Yeah, so, if, you're, if you're listening on the Front End First feed, most of the time, Ian, <laughs> just talk about nonsense. It's like if Se- and Seinfeld were Seinfeld. a podcast. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, this is our definitely most most technical one. It's but a, I, it's I think a you fun navigated pod. it well. Yes, we definitely describing. Did. Describing uh, technical concepts over audio is not always the easiest, but I think mm-hmm. for the most part it came through pretty well there, and I we understood so. what was going on. So uh, definitely, good and job, I, I won't I won't admit to this publicly, even though this is on two podcasts. <laughs> but I've been I've been moved a little bit. I, I I wouldn't even call it a, I wouldn't even call it Whoa. I wouldn't call it a step. I would just call it a slight lean, maybe. I'm not even just a lean. Just we I got to hook it. I em. get it. I get, it. I get it. I get it a little was, bit listen, more. You just you Real made my day, buddy. You made my yeah, day. I don't want to hear about it ever again. So don't bring this back to me. I don't want you to clip this part uh, on Twitter. Yeah. But yeah, it makes a little more sense. It makes listen, I gotta say sense. before we go, Aaron, you got a skincare routine or something just to bring back the mostly part of mostly technical. <laughs> Your face oh, always looks yeah, great on camera, man. Do you have this problem? Because we both make videos. You wake up and you're like. You know, I don't know. You got you got to be looking sharp for these cameras with these HD four K videos. It truly and is. you're always like yeah. so put together. I mean, you go to a sauna or a spa or something. What's the what's the secret? You know, you know, I don't. I took Accutane when I was sixteen, and I think it's still paying off. Um, but sometimes this is another secret. So this is nobody's listening at this point. <laughs> We're an hour and a half in, so it's just yeah, us. We can do. Us. We can go full skincare pod. Yeah, sometimes it. if I get sometimes if I get a bad one and I have to record, I I use my wife's concealer. Oh, nice. For sure. You know what? I've been this yeah, close to asking some of my girlfriends. Part, right? Like, yep. You know, I had to do a last video for the remix course, and I had like I was playing with my friend's dog and. We got in like a biting match because I, you know, mm-hmm. we were like chasing. Classic. You lost, and, and, and I lost, and he had a little red. I was like, I'm this close to going to Rite Aid and asking, what do women yep. do um, for this sort yes. of thing? But I haven't crossed that bridge yet. But I'm sure once you do, it's just you know, you're there. It it makes yeah. honestly like it just makes. Uh, yeah, it makes me feel good. But more importantly, it's like consistent, right? Yes. It's consistency. Yes. Yes. So I can continue yes. to record and not be like, oh, that was the day he had the massive zit on his head. And then, oh, this must be a different day because he doesn't have that anymore. Mm-hmm. And the funniest thing that had happened was, you know, I had I had a, a big one one day and I went out to my wife and I was like, hey, where's our makeup? <laughs> she was like, what do you mean? <laughs> She's like, dude. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Things but they've got this thing that you just you, know? you just like you just put a dot on it and then you kind of it just goes they away. Have the tech- they amazing. have the yeah, technology. It's amazing. That is amazing. But no, beyond that, I just use a bar of Dove soap on my face like a caveman. It's pretty good, man. Well, uh, yeah, dude, I really nice do like. I, I really have been right. enjoying following your your video work this year, man. Um, YouTube is tough. Thanks. And um, YouTube is tough. It's really tough. We could we could do a six hour pod on that, but yeah. um, we got to do a no- whole another one because I've been listening to you talk about. Top of funnel being YouTube, and it's boy, it's tough. It is. Yeah, you guys. Yeah, that would be a great one. I'd I'd love to see you guys do a uh, video, video oriented uh, something on YouTube at some point. It would be cool for screencasting.com and yeah, uh, kind of go back and forth there on that stuff. So nice, awesome guys. That was so much fun. Appreciate it. Yeah, Yeah. thanks for coming. This was great. Absolutely. All right, talk to you later. All right, bye.